Love it. Well done. Okay, welcome to our training on the public media talk show. Um, I want to introduce Andrea Ted Hope, who was the senior coordinating producer, I believe, of America Amplified 2020, um, which was the first iteration of this project. Um, and, you know, it basically got off the ground in March of 2020. So you can imagine what that meant for all of our engagement plans up in smoke. And what we did instead, and in addition, was uh, with Andrea taking the amazing lead, we produced two different series of national talk shows with uh, um, collaborating stations from across the country, two different hosts from different stations for each of six different shows about the pandemic, and then each of six different shows about the election. And Andrea was the executive producer of those talk shows, which again, trying to do this during the middle of a pandemic was insane. But we carried it out and we had, we had voices, the most amazing voices from all across the country, meeting and talking to each other on this show. And it was phenomenal radio. And she's gone on from there to reinvent a talk show at uh, WPLN in Nashville. And um, Andrea, welcome. I know you're gonna be training us on how to do this, but before you start doing that, tell us a little bit about This Is Nashville and what you're doing there. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, first I just wanted to say, um, just to kind of give a little bit more background, um, I started in talk shows at KCUR in Kansas City. Um, it was a daily, daily talk show at 10 a.m. and I was a, a producer there for several years. Um, after America Amplified, um, I really got to see how powerful um, incorporating community engagement into a show could really be. Um, and I left it really wanting to do that at the local level. I really, I mean, we had such a great impact at the national level, but to me, I think there's just so much more that you can accomplish at a local level. So that's what led me to, uh, to Nashville Public Radio, um, where they were uh, hiring a brand new team to, uh, to launch a brand new show. So um, Chelsea, if you can go to the next slide. So um, the show is called This is Nashville. Um, this is my team. I just want to give them a quick shout out. Um, we have our host, Khalil A. Colonna, senior producer, Steve Harouche, digital lead, Anna Gallegos Cannon, technical director, Michaela Elias, multimedia producers, Tasha Lemley and Rose Gilbert, and also not pictured here is our summer intern, Doreen Schonecki. So already, like I was so, um, so drawn to this place because they wanted to hire a seven person show team. And that is just such a great um, investment, not only in, um, you know, in the station, but also in the community. I really personally view a daily show as, as a, as, as a gesture to, to the community, as a real way of, of uh, serving the community and, and showing your dedication to them. So yeah, um, I got to come on board and recruit and hire this team. And um, yeah, it was, uh, thank you, Jessica. It was, it, we very intentionally hired a diverse team across the board, uh, race and ethnicity, um, age, background, um, we also hired a mix of old and new Nashville. You know, Nashville is a very changing city. Um, so some of my some of my producers have been here for more than two decades. Um, some of us are new, like me, um, and then everything in between. So I have always said that you really can't accomplish community engagement uh, truly without a diverse representative team. So it was really, really exciting to be able to build that um, from scratch here. Um, now, I know we don't all have a fresh start like this, but I'm really hoping this presentation will give you some ideas on how you can bake community engagement into your process or even your reporting. If, if, you're, if you're here and you're not working on a show, I think there are a lot of tips here that, that you can take away. So next slide, please. Um, before I uh, talk about how I built a community engaged show and sort of flip the script on the more traditional public radio talk show format, um, I'd love to invite you guys to share your questions. Again, whether you work for a, a show or not, um, I, I'd really love to help you work through any challenges you feel like you're facing. Um, you know, 
incorporating community engagement as, as you go about your daily workflow. So think about that as we go along. Um, feel free to throw them into the chat or save them for the end. It's, oh, tape's not live. Okay, that's not for me. Um, yeah, so if you have questions, throw them into the chat. Um, we'll do uh, questions at the end. So I'm gonna save like 10 to 15 minutes if I can. Well, actually, Andrea, I think that is a challenge. How do you do an, a, an engaged talk show if you're taped and not live? So. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. <laughs> I was like, is that about the webinar? Got it. Understood. Okay. I will definitely address that. Um, okay. Next slide. All right. So for the uh, months leading up to our launch, we the team came on board. We were all kind of onboarded um, by October, and then we launched March 1st. So um, for the month leading up to that date, we really embedded in the community. Um, we started off with a retreat with our team uh, where we kind of started to talk through our goals and create our mission statement. And actually like right at the beginning there, we, we turned to the community for help. So we convened a small focus group uh, that week of the retreat um, to get there to get a few community members feedback on on the goals that we were setting and you know down to the details like the language we were using in our mission statement. We also um, created it was a very small focus group it was three people, <laughs> but um, but we uh, kind of cast our net out a little uh, a little more broadly with a community survey that we created. So we asked three questions, and if you, as if you're familiar with American Amplified, you've probably heard iterations of these questions before. Um, it was, what do you want people to know about you and your community? What are your hopes for your community? What about your most urgent needs? And what do you want out of our daily show? So we created a survey uh, to, to reach people who we weren't encountering in person, but we also asked those questions um, just out in the field. And again, with, with such a big team, we were really able to uh, travel a lot of miles and um, engage with um, hundreds of people leading up to the launch of the show. I should also say that survey is still open um, and it lives on our landing page. So even after the launch, we still get daily, almost daily input uh, from the community. In January, um, this was kind of our second second go at a focus group. We held a virtual listening session. Um, we did not open it to the public, but instead we um, we reached back out to the people that we had met doing this community engagement uh, to bring them together um, and, and ask them, you know, what they thought about again the process that we were building. Um, and, and kind of expand on the questions we'd been asking. So we asked, you know, what do you think local media coverage is missing or doing wrong? Um, what are your questions or concerns about the future of our city? And uh, from that, we really honed in not only on topics to, to head into our, the launch of our show with, but also more importantly, how to cover them. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, like I said, we launched the show March 1st. Um, it is a live daily show. It's also a podcast. Uh, and really our, our part of our premise is journeying into the identity of Nashville. So I wanna play a clip from our very first episode. It, um, it lays out some of our goals and includes a montage that I built from those months of community engagement. Um, so go ahead and play that. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. From WPLN News and Nashville Public Radio, we're here with something brand new for you, our listeners. For years, you've been asking us for a daily show, and today, we're bringing it. This is Nashville! This is Nashville. This is Nashville. This is Nashville, Tennessee. This is Nashville. 
I can write you a poetic piece about it. <laughs> it's really different, but this is Nashville. This is Nashville. This is Nashville. This is definitely Nashville. Each weekday at noon, meet me right here on 90.3 FM or WPLN.org for This is Nashville. We'll go deeper on the news of the day with WPLN reporters and bring you perspectives you didn't know you were missing. Our show will sound different because it is different. We want to make space for those of us most affected by the latest developments in our city and region to bring folks together from diverse backgrounds to engage in dialogue across their differences. Now, when I say we'll go deeper on the news, I'm talking about getting to know our WPLN reporters and their process better. Like WPLN criminal justice reporter, Samantha Max. We still live in this community where it's not everyone has to deal with gunshots all the time. And it's just really important for me as a reporter to make that urgency known to all of our listeners, everyone in the community that we can't turn a blind eye to what's going on in this city. And getting a chance to interview reporters with their sources. Here's WPLN health reporter Blake Farmer with Sarah Dean, who's been working as an ICU nurse throughout the pandemic. When this started, we were it. We were the people in the room holding the iPads, watching a family member take their last breath. And you don't come back from that. And we do it over and over and over and over until finally somebody breaks. Blake, you, you've talked to a lot of nurses in your reporting. Mm. Do you feel like you've been able to fully capture the frustration? No, I mean, <laughs> not, not even close. I, I mean, you know, Sarah's the one who, who, who has <clears throat> been in the thick of it. I have been allowed one time into a COVID ICU through this whole pandemic. You can expect raw, real moments just like that every day here on This Is Nashville. So um, that, uh, well, you heard kind of at the start of that, in, in those months that we spent doing that community engagement, we invited every source that we interacted with to say the name of our show. Um, some of them sang it, um, some of them like really riffed on it and um, you know, I think it's it's gestures. That was such a small ask, but it's gestures like that that really help build a sense of collective ownership. And that's something that as we've gone along, we're really continuing to tend to and grow every day. Um, so some of another piece that you heard in that is that um, we built into the show every day uh, what, what I call a news hit. The start of the show is is really focused on elevating the the work that the reporters in the newsroom are doing something that I have seen uh, as a challenge in shows in my experience is, um, is not having a formalized bridge between the newsroom and the show. Um, we, we are really casting our net so wide with a seven person team, but we have a you know 30 person newsroom. And um, by building in that space to bring reporters on to come onto the show with their sources, we're really um, kind of just even expanding our source pool even more. So um, we said in that clip, uh, you know, we wanted to sound different. And I wanted to just kind of highlight some of the goals that we uh, hold ourselves to every day that I think really lead us to, to a show that sounds different. Um, pr we prioritize lived experience over traditional expertise. If you've read the playbook or have literally ever spoken to me for more than two seconds, you know, that's kind of my MO. Um, we make the most space on our show for just community members. We do invite officials to be a part of what we do, um, but we tend to turn to them more with an accountability lens. So um, we have a regular recurring segment or show called Citizen Nashville, where we um, focus in on a topic like public transportation or mental health, and we approach it with a public service mindset. So we bring in folks who, um, to share their lived experience. Um, if, if we talk about, you know, public transportation, what it's like navigating this city without a car. And then we bring the officials to the table, uh, to really answer, answer the community's questions directly. We use Harkin to solicit community questions and responses. We, um, put prompts out on Twitter. And uh, we also have a voicemail tool on our website um, where we solicit uh, voice messages from people. 
Um, we also make space for those who don't often get the microphone, uh, as was mentioned in that clip. We, uh, we elevate diverse perspectives, um, which we do intentionally. We set specific source diversity goals, and then we also uh, track that with a source diversity survey. Um, one of our big goals for this show was expanding our audience. Something else I've seen in my time working uh, in public media is a tendency to, uh, to prioritize our, our current listening audience. Um, when we set out with this show and a community engagement focus, our goal was really more to expand. Uh, public media has a very loyal audience. We can afford to spend more time on the folks we're not already reaching. And that is something that, you know, certainly if you all have audience departments, you know that they, they can really help with that. But I like to say that our sourcing and all of this time that, that you spend building your source pool has that effect as well. Like if you build those relationships, you maintain this follow-up with your sources, you're starting to create a show for people who will come back and listen, even if they're not guests on the show. Um, kind of along those lines, meeting people where they are, just being out in the community, that sounds so simple, but as I think a lot of us know, like when you're in the daily grind, it's really hard to find time to be out in the community. Um, one of the ways that we've made that a priority and a reality here for This is Nashville is um, almost every day we have uh, a scene from out in the community that starts the show. We have pre-produced features. We uh, pre-record some of our pre-interviews so that we're really maximizing, spending time out in the field, but also maximizing the perspectives that you hear on the air. Um, all right, let's see. I'm just gonna answer a few of these questions really quickly. Um, there's a question about, um, how do you turn each live show into a podcast episode? Uh, we, we have a technical director who, um, who edits the audio right after the show. We keep it pretty, pretty live to tape, so there's not a lot of editing afterwards. Um, but uh, we use um, PRX to distribute that. Um, but we are available on all the podcast platforms, and we do have a significant listening audience that engages with, with us that way. All right, I'm gonna, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so a really big piece of the community engagement puzzle is fostering these ongoing relationships that I've touched on um, with our sources and listeners and closing that feedback loop. So really keeping the communication lines open. Um, our community engagement did not stop after launch. Uh, we continue to work to source our ideas from the community engagement. So um, some of our process leans on calling up the sources that uh, we met back, you know, whether it was from our community engagement before the launch or uh, previous guests that we've, that we've encountered. Um, if, if we're, I, I encourage the producers when they're thinking about pitches to really look outside of their own personal bubbles and just call people up and ask them like, what's going on in your neck of the woods? What do you want us to talk about? Um, we also have a practice of running our ideas by our guests, um, especially when um, we feel like, I, I mean, you know, there are certain topics that I think lend themselves really well to this. And one of them has been gun violence. Um, we, we, really, um, we really make a, a, a an effort to meaningfully partner with the community. And that includes running by running our language by them, um, asking them, you know, what questions do you want us to ask in this show? What do you hope you, we get out of this episode? Um, we, have, uh, we have a recurring segment called Pin Drop, where we uh, drop a pin on the map and um, it might be like a generic uh, CVS building. <laughs> But back in the day, it was a, a, a famous jazz club. Um, we're dropping pins throughout the city. And um, recently, um, one of those stories was about Elizabeth Park, which, which is in um, a historically Black part of town, uh, North Nashville. 
essentially there were murals that went up recognizing the matriarchs, these black women who really like held that neighborhood together. And um, the, when we set out to do that show, uh, the descendants of those women didn't know us. They weren't quite ready to talk to us. So we, we set aside time for our, one of our producers to go to the, to go to the park, to continue to engage, meet these women in person. And, um, and, event, and, and from that, uh, we were able to build that trust and, and do a whole episode recognizing uh, these really powerful women. So there are, there are bets that we place like that. That's like, listen, we wanna take the time to build the trust um, however long it takes. So that's kind of, that's one of the ways that we've really baked this in. We also have a weekly segment. Oh, can you go back? Yeah. We have a weekly segment called At Us um, that uh, our digital lead, Anna, um, she, you know, runs our social media accounts. Um, basically, we, we solicit feedback from our listeners and our guests every day on the show and online. And also in our, um, we send thank you emails after each show soliciting feedback. And so every Thursday we um, start the show with a segment addressing that feedback. Um, I'll just give a quick example. Uh, on our first show, we had a Cherokee historian and activist on the show who talked about ancient Nashville and a bustling metrop metropolis populated by hundreds of thousands of Native Americans at the time, you know, a really, really long time ago. And a listener wrote in challenging some of the numbers that he heard. So from that, we addressed that feedback in our segment called At Us. And then we actually did, uh, did some research and did a whole episode um, high, like uncovering and, and kind of looking into our indigenous roots. Uh, we also, there was, there was one show that we did about um, local meat processing, farming processing to table. And uh, we got a lot of angry uh, tweets from vegans just concerned about the, the panel that we had. And so once again, we addressed that feedback. Um, and I actually called one of, the, one of the tweeters, had a quick conversation with him and then used, used some of that um, in that uh, segment. So it's been a really nice way to um, to show the community that we are listening to them and we proactively are doing something with their feedback. So it's also a super fun segment and I just pulled a, a clip from one, if you wanna play it, Chelsea. One of our listeners named Bailey added us on Twitter with a kind of weird out of the box question that she thought her friends at This Is Nashville could help her answer. Okay. Uh, the question was, what is the, quote, new ugly apartment complex that blocks the view of the city on um, I-65 North? Hmm. I mean, I feel like I've seen a lot of ugly buildings. <laughs> so did you find it? Yes. After a lot of searching, I finally found it. It's actually called um, the Haven at the Gulch and is being built on the I-65 and I-40 split. Is it really that ugly? So, I mean beauty subjective, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it really, really makes me want to play Tetris when I see that building. Oh, wow. Okay. I'll have to be sure to check it out. I also love that Bailey knew she could count on her pals here at This Is Nashville. Oh, that was, that's just kind of, I mean, it's, it's been a really fun segment. It's also been really cool to see um, the payoff of that. Like the more that we address these things head on, the more, um, the more responses that we've gotten from people that tweet that we addressed in that clip um, from this listener, uh, we get random prompts like that. Like uh, someone listening to uh, the mayor's state of the city address reached out to us with a question afterwards um, based on the topics that they had heard on our show and the way that we, that the way that we had shown, we'll, we'll answer your questions if you have them. All right, next slide. So, um, about three months in, um, I rounded up some of the praise that we had received. Um, and honestly, um, we, we had gotten a lot and I think it was, um, it was really encouraging to see that because I think um, for those of us who work in shows, you know that it's, I feel like it's more likely that people will 
be very in the weeds about, oh, you said this word wrong, or I didn't like the way the host uh, addressed this. There's a lot of room for criticism. And I do think, you know, I, I think that criticism can be very warranted. It's been super encouraging to see the kind of feedback that we've gotten. Um, very specifically, like, feedback that stands out to me addresses that um, this is something that they can't remember the city without. Um, someone also, uh, as you can see, wrote in that they were listening to that, that state of the city speech. And um, I think that was like a month or two in and they were like, we should have a bingo card with past episodes because of the, the points that he was hitting, we had hit them. Um, this is, this is a, a really encouraging way to see that we are um, actively listening to the community and paying attention to um, the topics that they want us to cover. So I think there are, there are a few key takeaways that really, that really led to this. Um, engaging meaningfully at every level and step of the process. It does take time, but I think it's, it's really worth it to, to be spending the time to follow up um, when you get that feedback, um, especially negative feedback, following up one-on-one, -on -one, engaging and asking, you know, being exploratory with it. Like what, what, is, what is it that you are concerned with and how can we address it on the show? Um, I think the biggest, um, the biggest missteps that I've seen and in this industry is not building in the time for follow-up and it is definitely not a perfect process and it's hard, but I think it's worth it. Um, and also, you know, being creative about how to partner with the community. Um, so obviously I mentioned that focus group and I think there were a few questions about um, what kinds of suggestions we got. Um, when we held that focus group and then the listening session, we heard a few things. Um, people were feeling uh, worn down by our divisions and feeling like they wanted, uh, they wanted to feel connected with their community and the community that they, that they had never met. They wanted, to, um, they wanted us to highlight uh, shared values. Um, so that's something that we, that we wrote down and formalized as a goal for our show. Um, it's actually something that, you know, even if we, even if we don't have people on the show who disagree, we almost every day have people who come from different neighborhoods, different backgrounds, um, who otherwise might not have a chance to ha have that crossover, have a chance to interact with each other. Just today we had on uh, tenants who are seeking affordable housing today and a landlord who has, has tried to uh, tried to help with that. And at the end of our show, they were sharing, we had to stop them because they started sharing phone numbers with each other <laughs> on the show. Um, but it's that kind of, um, that kind of crossover uh, has been really, really encouraging to see. Um, so uh, one other piece of that, that partnership, um, finding ways to partner with the community, um, we started adding a special thanks at the end of each episode to give credit to community members um, who, you know, essentially I've encouraged, as I've encouraged producers to, to source their ideas from the community, we then in turn um, give credit to those community members um, that that's where the idea came from. We follow up with them to let them know um, how they influenced our show. That's been a really powerful, powerful thing. Um, uh, we also just in terms of the, the scripting itself, um, yeah, I, I, there are a lot of technical, um, technical pieces of this that I'm going to share in a one sheet after, after this presentation, but really partnering with the guests in the moment to help, let them help you guide the live conversation, um, asking them in the show, what questions they have for each other. Um, taking down questions from, from the guests and then posing them after the show to, to the officials. We often ask uh, in our show, what, what would you like to see from the city or the county or the state? Um, and then we, we, we aim to take the time to, to get those questions to the officials. So um, 
I think I'm going, I think let's go to the next slide. And I'm sorry, I, I was ambitious thinking that I could uh, read the questions while speaking. <laughs> so um, I'm going to kind of go back through some of these. Um, um, I wrote them down and I can just run through them for you. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> so one that got a couple um, plus ones for, I also want to know this, was um, uh, we don't have an audience department and social media person at WESA. We're a three-person team of host, editor, producer. Um, what are some of the easy entry... Easy entry point, big impact things that a smaller team with less institutional support um, would you, that you would recommend the show adopt. Yeah, well, so do you all have uh, do you have social media accounts that you run? Uh, sorry, I don't know if I can talk. Yes, <laughs> we do have a Twitter. Um, it's not. I mean, like to be perfectly honest, like we do our best. But also we have like a show that we have to do every single day. So um, right. we do have a Twitter account. The station has a Twitter account, a Facebook, and an Instagram, which we have been trying to do some cross promotion on. But those are the social accounts that we have. Okay. Yeah, I mean, my first thought about that is like, I don't know what kind of relationship you have with the broader newsroom right now, but if 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 you can. Um, I mean, is there a social media person who works for the newsroom? No. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's really hard. It's really hard. And I, I totally get that. Um, do you live, does anyone live tweet during the show? So um, we, we, we don't like we could in theory. Um, so we have our host who's on the air and there's me that directs the show and sub host. Yeah. Um, and then we have our producer who's also our board off. Okay. Um, so most people have their hands in something, either I'm moving a guest between here and there, my host is actually on the mic and my producer is obviously on the board. So yeah. we do have an intern, uh, we thought about live tweeting, but, uh, I was never sure about the impact that that would have. Yeah. Because I, I, uh, I guess I didn't have a chance. I haven't had a chance to measure it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I will say, I mean, live tweeting and I, I remember I used to direct the show and patch in all the guests. And if, if it was like a lighter show or there were less moving pieces, I would try to live tweet. It does help your engagement, but that's not the, that, that's not the biggest impact, smallest entry point thing that I would recommend. Um, I think if you can, um, honestly, this survey that we set up has been a super light lift. Um, it was the survey that I mentioned where we just asked these three questions, like, what do you want out of our show? What are your hopes and needs? You can change the questions, but um, I think that's been a really cool way to, uh, to get interactions um, even without trying. So I will share, um, I will share the link to that. And, and this will be in that tip sheet that I send out. But um, basically, I mean, I think one of the most efficient ways to get out into the community, especially when you're a small shop and you actually can't physically get out, is um, sending a survey link to neighborhood associations, to, um, to uh, church leaders, to, I mean, just think about like with your community, who, who are kind of, what are kind of the most um, communicative and, and biggest groups that you could, you could really start with partnering with that the leader of that group, and they can distribute that for you. Um, and then as far as um, one thing that I think has helped our survey stay in circulation is that every day in the script, we mention it. We mention it at the beginning. We mention it at the end. Um, we're always prompting people. Um, and honestly, even I think the, the design of our landing page is helpful because if we just keep mentioning this is Nashville.org, you go to that and it's like, you know, three stories down, we have, you see the survey prompt or you see the Harkin prompt. So I think that's a, that's probably my top recommendation there. Um, a couple survey related questions. Uh, um, what kinds of suggestions do you get from the focus about new ways to cover news? So um, we, one of the things that we, 
one of the things that uh, we heard was be more human. <laughs> um, people were like, in the in the virtual listening session, especially, uh, a few people pointed out that, you know, they're like, we know you're journalists, we know that, you know, we need to get the news from you, we need you to be objective, but also like, show us your humanity more. Um, I thought that was really interesting, um, especially because I think so much of what we heard that day was the news is heavy, we need some relief, we need some joy, we need to feel connected in some way. So the way that we that the way that we applied that was really thinking about the tone that we strike, the language that we use, um, um, and also just being humble, honestly, um, acknowledging if there if if my host or anyone our, on our team does have a personal connection to the heavy news that we're covering, we talk about that. If we interview a reporter about a piece of news that affects them or their children, um, we ask them about that. So. Um, that was that was one thing that we heard that we that we kind of directly directly addressed. Um, and then, what format or platform do you use for the survey? Yeah, uh, we use um, uh, Microsoft or Teams, which I would not recommend. Um, you should you should use Google. That is, I'm a I'm a Google person. I think the the Google format is way better. But if you have Microsoft Teams, it works fine. Um, I think, I guess maybe it's SharePoint. I'm, I get a little in the weeds on all of the many Microsoft products, but um, I think the key with the survey is to keep it simple. So we included, like I said, those three questions, and then we did a little um, source demographic uh, uh, dem yeah, info at the end. Um, but again, I will share that link with you guys so you can see it. Cool. Um, how did you find your focus group? So those were um, uh, sources that we were meeting with our community engagement. So um, it was it was very early on in the process, which I think is, and it was you know it was during our retreat. So again, we didn't have like a high turnout, but honestly, that that actually turned out better. We ended up having this super focused, productive discussion um, with with just a few community members. So honestly, if you spent time. Um, uh, convening community members, even if you get a, a small turnout, I think when we plan these things, it can be disappointing to see only a few people show up, but you can actually have really, really powerful discussions with a small group. Um, what audience and engagement metrics do you track or how do you measure success? So we, um, we, we measure, uh, uh, the growth on our social media accounts. Um, we we pay attention to the performance of our uh, web posts. So I, I know I mentioned um, part of our goal has been, well, actually I don't think I mentioned this. One of our goals was to, um, to present our content on multiple platforms in multiple, um, like, so essentially we wanted to have a digital experience of the show. So even if you don't listen to the show, we wanted you to be able to consume our content that way. So when we do features, we always have dedicated web posts. Um, when we when we do our recurring Citizen Nashville show, where we round up community questions and answer them, we always do a kind of transcript, but better organized um, digital component to that, so that we can show people like these are your questions and these are the answers. Um, so we, um, we measure the success of those web posts. Um, we also, uh, from, that, from those metrics, we have found that our landing page actually um, is, is among our like top performing <laughs> um, links, which I think I, I know I said how successful that survey has been. Um, that shows me that, that that's really reaching people. Like when we mention our website, mention how people can engage with us, we get a, a really great um, return on that. Um, can you clarify when you do news hits um, and pre-recorded in the community features, are they part of every show? Um, so every day we start with a news hit. So we our first segment is an interview with a reporter. Um, it's not always an in-house reporter. 
but um, that is how we, how we start the show every day. And then um, was it, what was the second part? Um, the features, the in the community features. So we don't have a feature every day um, that even with a seven person team, that's a little too much. <laughs> Um, but we do have um, very sound rich features uh, every week. Um, there is, so I remember when I, when I was at KCUR and we were, we were kind of Mary Lee more like a three person um, organization or a, a team. Um, it was, it was really like a, it was a big deal if we could get a scene, like some sound from out in the community to start the show. It was a big deal if we could respond to tweets during the show. It was a big deal if we had clips. With, with our team, we've been able to have either a scene, either clips or a feature every single day. I do think that there is something, I think smaller operations could, uh, could achieve this if you, um, if you try things like pre-interviewing people out in the field, um, pre recording a pre-interview, um, that's something that even we do when we're thinking about um, getting more perspectives in the show. Um, I sometimes when we know we want a certain guest, um, one of the rather than rather than sending a producer out into the field to get a scene um, to get a separate scene, I will sometimes say, okay, like what does that guest do? Let me, um, let me be specific because it's hard to talk in generals about this. We're having a show about community gardens next week. There is a, there is a woman who's going to be a guest on our show who has been um, tending to her own community garden for a really long time. So rather than, we already knew we wanted her as a guest. So I sent our intern out to the field to pre-interview her in person, but also record her experience walking through the garden with her. So the what we got out of that was some sound to start our show and also knocked the pre-interview out already. Um, so our, every show is very sound rich, um, but there are, there are some tips and tricks for how to do that even if you don't have that kind of staffing. Um, can you break down the roles of your team? Um, yeah, so... Uh, I, okay, yes. So we have um, the senior producer um, is, well, the senior producer and the multimedia producers are on the hook for one to two shows per week. So each producer, um, I assign the show, the show topic from our pitch meetings, and then um, each producer will um, draft up the premise, um, which is usually, we've usually gotten that kind of, we've been brainstorming that together if it came up in a pitch meeting. So the producers start by drafting up the premise and then um, start to think about, you know, who, who are the guests that we want for this show. And one of our priorities there is think right, right at the start, think about who is the most affected. Um, so that's, that's kind of our in when we start brainstorming guest ideas. And then each producer um, pre-interviews guests. Um, we come back together as a team uh, with the host, myself, and that producer. And we talk about, um, we kind of finalize the, the lineup and the rundown together. Um, the technical director uh, is responsible for running the board during the show, um, facilitating our guest connections, um, our digital lead uh, live tweets, um, she edits our web content and um, our, let's see, who did I miss? Did I miss somebody? I think that's it. I think that's it. And our host hosts the show every day. <laughs> um, he also does a, a recurring feature every week. Um, this question's kind of fun. What was the hardest show you've done and how did the team um, get through it? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Um, we had we had an episode about license plate readers, um, which the city has been uh, the city has been 
um, moving to install license plate readers to um, in, in neighborhoods to you know crack down on crime essentially, and um, community members have been very concerned about what that means for their um, you know for for you know exacerbating the profiling that they feel like they've already been experienced experiencing by police. Um, this was very early on after we launched. We had an ep episode about that, and we invited um, we invited people who had vastly different opinions on that up on that uh, on license plate readers, and um, we had a little bit of a, a a live heated debate that got a little unruly and intense. Um, but I think the 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 takeaway from that that I thought was really great, um, we we got feedback from a few of the guests on that episode about um, feeling like essentially all of our guests on that episode were um, were black and they uh, one of our guests reached out to us ap afterwards and said, you know, I really felt like you were um, pitting us against each other and gave us some feedback. Like, I, I wish that you had um, a more diverse panel. So I mentioned earlier that sometimes we call people back and ask them to weigh in on, you know, the questions and the panel and how, how we're doing it. That guest uh, later, I mean, we kept in touch with him. We addressed his feedback on air. Um, and we, we worked with him to inform some of our future, um, future episodes. And we also made a plan to kind of return to talking more about license plate readers um, as that moves through the council. So that was, that was one challenging, uh, challenging episode. And I also will say, anytime you lean into having um, dialogue across differences live on the air, like it can be a little bit intense. Um, but, and that's something uh, actually also from that, I um, have been working with the host to get some, some local training on, on mediation. Um, so that's been something that we're kind of pursuing as well. A couple more questions, there's rolling in. Uh, yes. How is the show performing at noon? Do you know the weekly Metro Cume or Share? That is a good question. And I actually just asked our, asked uh, our VP to send me the latest numbers um, recently. Uh, so I don't have that number right in front of me right now, Paul, but I will, um, I, I would love to share that with you when, when I when I get it. Um, I, I do know a lot of our listeners do listen um, to the podcast. So it'll be interesting to see uh, the latest breakdown on that. Um, do you respond to breaking news? And if you do, how do you respond to breaking news? Yeah, so part of the reason that I built in the the beginning of the show like I did, um, dedicating that first 13 minutes to uh, to to the reporters of the newsroom was to kind of bake that in so that you know depending on depending on the size of the breaking news, um, we could either pivot for that first segment or if it's something bigger, we could pivot for the whole show. So we're most responsive to the breaking news in that first segment. Um, we, when the, uh, when the Dobbs ruling came down, we pivoted on our, our whole show. Um, in, that, in that case, um, we, had, we had a breaking news plan in place. Like we had already done a show about abortion access in Tennessee. And so um, knowing that that ruling was, was coming, um, we, had, we put together a production document going back to some of the sources that we met already um, and they were kind of on call. But um, yeah, I mean, the, the show schedule, like meeting schedule that I've built, we have a 9 a.m. meeting every day where, you know, if something has developed overnight, um, we, will, we will come together as a team and, and brainstorm, you know, how, how responsive do we need to be to that breaking news? Um, when you do engagement events in the community, what do those look like and where do you go? So the, the listening session that I mentioned, we did that virtually in January because we were still, I mean, it doesn't really feel like we're ever not to be negative, but we're ever going to be out of this pandemic. Um, 
So that felt like the most responsible way to do it at the time. Um, our plan is to, um, in, in August, get out into the community um, while, while we can be outside. Um, so we're, we're actually in the process of planning our in-person listening sessions now. Um, it's challenging because um, the, the um, demands of the, of the Daily Show, even with a large team, it's hard, to, it's hard to take days off. And also, like, we don't have time to pre-record episodes. So that's, that's kind of a challenge, but um, we're going to bring, you know, the same goals that we, or the same um, strategy that we had um, when sending the producers, when, when kind of going out into the field leading up to launch, we'll apply that same mentality. Like what are the communities that we feel like we've been, we've been missing? Um, so that's how we'll kind of hone in on, on where to go. Um, but also, I, I do just want to say, and I really felt this takeaway from America Amplified, um, convening people virtually is, is really can be a more accessible um, option for a lot of people. You know, um, a lot of people, I mean, we have different working hours, but I think we found with America Amplified, and we found this in January too, that catching people with the hour after they get off work in the evening and just giving them the option to just hop on a call is, is really a lot, a lot more tenable for a lot of folks. So, um, I still do, I, I've been, I've, I've come over to the dark side on virtual engagement, um, over the past few years. I think it can be super useful. That's great, Andrea. Thank you so much. Um, I can throw your contact info up on the screen really quick and I'll share it um, with everyone as well um, in a follow up. Oh, let's, um, yeah, keep in touch. Um, follow both Andrea and the show on Twitter. Um, they're also on Instagram um, for This Is Nashville. Um, yeah, this was really great. Thank you for all your thoughtful questions and also Andrew for your thoughtful answers. Um, I think I got every question that was in the chat. So, all right. Yeah, thank, thank you, you guys. so much. Thank that you was guys great. for all the questions. Um, I, I'm going to send out a one sheet with some tips. So I'm, I'm also happy to stay in touch. If you have any questions later, please do let me know. Thank you. You're inspiring as always. Thank you. Bye everybody.